again, uh, if you want to turn along with this morning, I'm going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll be starting in verse 11. Uh, I'm going to take a little larger passage of scripture than we do sometimes, but um, I can find no place to, to really cut it off. So we'll, we'll be looking at the... Uh, the messenger's marching orders. This whole passage speaks of our call to be messengers, the message that we receive, the, the message that we deliver, all of these different aspects. And it starts with, with motivation for being a, a messenger. Now, we have very specific instructions from God himself about how we are to relate to the world around us. And that's both inside and outside the body of Christ, that, that we are called ambassadors, that, that we are called to be God's representatives. Now, there are specific people, people like myself, that believe they've been called into ministry where, where we speak the word of God to a company of people and... That's a particular ministry that you may or may not be called to. But every last single one of us says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. So you have not just the privilege, but the responsibility to speak on God's behalf. As, as a child of his, as a citizen of his kingdom, as an individual who's been called by name, by God himself, into a family, into a kingdom, we have that as a responsibility that's ours to be faithful with. It's a stewardship that we've been called into. Like I said, every single one of us will have a a different dimension, your platform may be primarily your family or your community or this church body or the community. We all have these different dimensions of life. I'm every bit as much called, but no less called to personal ministry, one-on-one -on -one with people as you are, but that may be your primary thing. I had an opportunity Last night, uh, one of the brothers there at the at the river was speaking of his week and what had went on, and, and he's a truck driver. And he was talking about just the opportunities that he'd had with other truck drivers over the course of the week to speak on God's behalf and to pray over these people. And, I mean, one of the guys that he mentioned by name, two or three others that were there, they perked up and it was like, you're kidding. Because they just didn't believe anybody would have enough boldness to speak to this guy because he's just mean as a snake. He's the meanest guy this fellow knows. And he just felt like it was, it was time. And that he had to speak for God to this guy. And unbeknownst to him, he wasn't incredibly, and he was startled. And he kind of recoiled from him a little bit, but he felt absolutely bold to stand there before him and just come what may. Now, he, he didn't know that the guy wouldn't, you know, jack his jaw for him. He, he didn't know that for sure, but to be faithful to speak was something he was willing, he's willing to risk that in the moment and really felt like it was the time. He hadn't done it before, but and he may not be in a position to do it in the future, but that was the time. And so here we are this morning, looking at a passage of scripture that will lay that out very clearly for us. Now, there, there's another word that's used in this passage that I want to point out before we even read reconciliation and being reconciled see every single one of us fit into this passage of scripture because of that word 
We are either in need of reconciliation or we have been reconciled. And if we've been reconciled, we have a ministry of reconciliation to see that others are reconciled to God. So let's dig in. I'm, this morning, I'm not going to read through the whole passage because it's a little more lengthy than we usually try to deal with. So I'm just going to read it a, a piece at a time. And we're going to start with the motive, the first motive of the messenger. It says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves to again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Motivation number one, Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We do need to speak persuasively. And this is a tactic that we need to use in, in approaching others with the gospel of reconciliation. You, you couldn't make the case to someone else that they needed to be reconciled to God without first making the case that there is a need for reconciliation, that, that there is enmity, that we are enemies through wicked works. Enemies in our mind, Paul says in Ephesians, through wicked works, that we all like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has gone to his own way. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, all humanity, but when we go to, to be a reconciler, when we take the message of reconciliation to someone else, we don't do that from a place of, of pride. We don't do that from a place of a holier than thou position. We do that from a place of we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same condition. I don't tell somebody else they need reconciled to God because I never needed reconciled to God. I tell them because I know something of the terror of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is that understanding that there is a God who is powerful enough to speak the whole universe into existence. And I, through my own rebellion, have made myself an enemy of his. But God, but God who is rich in mercy, he gave his son to reconcile us who were enemies in our minds through wicked works. We lay down our rebellion and he's willing to take us back due to the merit of his son's sacrifice on the cross. Motivation number one. Motivation number one is knowing the terror of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing how terrifying it would be to stand before him without the covering of his son's sacrifice. You may wonder why I come here Sunday after Sunday and spend so much time speaking of these things that the vast majority of people who will get covered here on any given Sunday are reconciled to God. The reason that I do this is this motivation. This William Booth, who was founder of the Salvation Army, what he said he wanted to do with his folks was to bring them and dangle them over the edge of hell that he might send them out to find hell-bound people and bring them to a loving God. Bring them, there was the ministry of reconciliation, but the motivation, the motivation for the ministry of reconciliation will be two things. Number one, it will be the knowledge of the fear of the Lord, the knowledge of the terror of the Lord. This idea that when we see people and we recognize that they are outside the covenant of grace, that they have no gracious claim on the mercies of God, 
We should be terrified for them. And I can tell you without any fear of contradiction that the reason more people do not come to repentance, the reason that more people do not have the fear of the Lord in their own hearts is because they do not see the fear of the Lord for them expressed from the Christians that they associate with. We need to be sure that we saturate our understanding. We take our consciousness and we focus it on the terror of the Lord. Even though we have escaped and we should have perfect confidence in the God who has saved us and reconciled us unto himself, we should not recoil from being having before our gaze the, the fear of the Lord, the, the fearful judgment that those who are without God in this world will face someday. We need to be moved by fear to go in the fear of the Lord to preach the grace of God, but the need for reconciliation. See, it's this, it's this ministry of reconciliation that is so much absent in so many quarters in the church. It's about all sorts of benefits that you get, but the heart of the gospel is being reconciled to God. We who were all enemies of God are now made his friends, his children, his bride, all these different metaphors that are used. Each one of those speaks though of union with God himself. He says, his sheep know his voice. Therefore, there is this connection where we hear him, we fellowship with him, we walk with him. In other words, if you've been reconciled with him, that means you've established relationship. And once established in relationship, your greatest desire should be to see others join to him as well. And the motivation behind that will first be your fear for their missing out on the only hope of eternal life, the only hope of missing the damnation of hell for every single human being is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we have received that gospel, when we have had our sins covered, atoned for, then we are in a position to immediately to immediately be among those who can share the story of what's happened to us. And that's all it really takes. I mean, you should be working towards biblical understanding. You should be you know, bathing yourself in this word so it gets on the inside of you and you can better understand what's happened to you. But it's as simple as the, as the, the blind man who was healed on the Sabbath and was being questioned by the Pharisees and, and who is this? He says, I don't know. All I know is once I was blind, but now I see. Once I was dead in trespasses and sins, but Almighty God gave me a new birth whereby I slayed down my rebellion and embraced the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I've been reconciled to him. I'm no longer his enemy. I no longer strive. I strive to obey him rather than to disobey and live in rebellion. This is a complete change of life and it's available to anyone who's on the outside looking in and we were all we all start on the outside. Let's look at verse 13. The mindset of the messenger. It says, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. I just kind of put this as the mindset of the messenger because right now I am a messenger to you. And you may think he's out of his mind. How can you get that stirred up about this stuff every Sunday morning? Well, it stirs me up. And, and then other times, it, it's very straightforward, laying precept upon precept so you can have a foundation of understanding built under you. All of those things are necessary, whether it be 
that you think I'm out of my mind because I'm exercised about these things or whether it be how, how can he be so logical about things that touch us so deeply emotionally. Both of those things are necessary. They were necessary in Paul and they're necessary in me and they will be necessary in you. You, you need to take these things to heart. You, you need to not be able to think of someone being one heartbeat, one breath away from hell and not be moved by that. I, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm acquainted with it. I know that it is absolutely possible to be there. When I think about these things, when I push these things to the front of my mind, I am appalled. I am amazed. I am absolutely incredulous about the fact that I can be that person that, that through the familiarity with people and they've been the people they've been for so long and and you know that they are however you long you've known them they're that much closer to hell than they were when you met them yet be unmoved in the moment as to their salvation we think well, good grief, you're preaching awful hard to us. No, I'm preaching awful hard to me too. All of us need this. All of us can be, can become distracted by many things. And all of us have to be reminded that the, it's the terror of the Lord that gets our attention focused on others. And it, it is that that gets us to move past our fears or apathy, whatever you might be dealing with in the moment, either, either distraction or, or the cares of the world that shadow out the, the need of the moment, we can overcome that, but we can do that if we ourselves make ourselves think about these things. It's easy to, it's easy to just be blessed it's easy to just um, enjoy the, the benefits of salvation and the, the glories of the presence of God and, and all of these things that come to us. But there is that dimension of our walk with God in which it is outward focused. He puts a lot into us and it's enjoyable. But what we have to be sure we don't neglect in the light of that is there's so many on the outside that desperately need what's been given to us. And it's been freely given to us and we should freely give to others. Motivation number two is revealed in the next couple of verses, 14 and 15. It says, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The love of Christ compels us. The love that was shown through the person of Jesus Christ the father says he loved the world so much that he gave his son. He died. So if he died for all, all died. So all need salvation. There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Every single individual must be saved. We, we look out and it's very easy to make a distinction between the upright in the community and the person who is kind of the dregs of society. You, you have the one who, who is a, a, an abuser uh, in so many different ways. And then you have the other one who is upstanding and a leader in the community. Each of those, though the one's condemnation may be deeper the other's condemnation is real outside of Christ. All must be saved. God has no grandchildren. All must be saved. 
Each one must be born again. Each one must establish their own surrender, their own ownership of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, their own claim on His saving grace. It is for the individual must enter in. Each and every last one of them all died and He died for all. Therefore, the love of God compels us when you were saved, the Holy Spirit took up residence on the inside of you. And apart from the quenching of the Spirit, which would be the, the, the dampening of His love on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The love of God compels you to go, compels you to speak. How, can, how could it be that we could love someone, realize that they are bound for hell, realize we have the remedy, and remain silent? Let that soak for just a minute. Because that chain of logic derails. You cannot follow that to a destination. If the love of God is on the inside of you, you will not. Now, I'm not saying you won't. I know that it's true of me that on occasion you will miss an opportunity. You will be silent when you should have spoke. I'm not saying that that cannot happen. But what I am saying is the Holy Spirit is in you. You have the gospel received into your own self and you see someone who needs it. You cannot not desire to speak. You can desire to speak or you can desire to speak and not know what to speak. You can desire to speak and be afraid to speak. But I am telling you beyond any shadow of doubt, if the Holy Spirit is residing in you, if you are being led by the Spirit, He will be compelling you, compelling you into the ministry of reconciliation. He will be compelling you to speak the truth of the gospel to others who desperately need it. It will be there. I know for a fact that, that I fail many times, but I, I also know that the love of God compels me. Even when I foolishly deny to go and do what I know I should, I still desired it. I still desired it, and I believe you do too. So in the midst of all of that, go with him in truth. Go with him in and, and take the truth of God with you as you go. Here's the standard for the messenger in the next couple of verses. Verse 16 says, Therefore, from now on, regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no, thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The standard of the messenger. The importance of this passage, this portion of the passage to us as individual believers is this. You are not disqualified by that which is in your past. You may think, well, I'm... I, I was a notorious sinner in my past. Well, I, I don't think you're probably um, a more notorious sinner than the guy writing this passage of Scripture. I mean, you didn't kill Christians, I don't think. At least not most of you anyway haven't, haven't engaged in, in killing Christians. Yet he was not disqualified from even being a called an apostle. He calls himself later in life the chief of sinners, but he is an apostle for our Lord Jesus Christ, a sent one establishing half of the New Testament. Here he is living out the thing that he is proclaiming to us. Old things have passed away. All things became new. You're new. You're new. Your failure yesterday, your failure in your life BC, 
all the things that the accuser of the brethren would come at you with and tell you, you are disqualified from speaking on God's behalf. Hogwash, all of it. Absolute lies from the pit. Here we are being told in no uncertain terms, old things have passed away. Whoever is great is a new creation. You are brand new. You get a new start. And the mercies of God are new every day. Every day. That means as a, as a holder of the grace of God, as one who walks with him in truth, as you walk down through this life and all of a sudden you have a colossal failure. I mean, it happens. None of us want it to happen. But, but it happens to most, if not all. There will be some colossal failure. And in that moment, you will feel disqualified. And I, I really don't have a problem with you or with myself feeling disqualified in that. There, there needs to be some consequence to failure. And there always is. But this speaks to us so particularly that we are a new creation and we are ever new. And our failure from a moment ago, a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago, however long ago it was, whatever it is that comes up out of your past and says, I can't do this because realize you are a new creation. And that is not a disqualifying thing. I know people who have been disqualified from preaching ministry because of things that have went on in their distant past. Now, if I have some colossal failure, now there needs to be a restoration process for sure. I mean, I don't expect to just jump right back in and, and, and do uh, ministry before the church after after some huge moral failing immediately but what I'm saying is there is no one there is no one who disqualifies failure is not final God is always about restoration he is always about bringing back the the one leaving the 99 and going after the one you are a new creation it sounds like humility, but typically it is little more than an excuse. It's a thin hedge that we hide behind. We can find a failure and we can say, well, no, I can't be used in that way because you remember that thing I did back then. And instead of that being humility, it is a form of rebellion is to say, no, I'm not going to go there. And here's my excuse. I've got an excuse. Um, I've got five new yoke of oxen that I've got to go look after. I mean, when Jesus said, come and go, they all made excuse. Don't make any excuses. Own, own the, the, the privilege, own the ministry, own the thing that God has given each of us to do, and that is enter into the work of reconciliation. Jesus died that he might reconcile the world unto himself, that human beings would surrender to him and be welcomed into his kingdom. We are the ambassadors for another world. We're an ambassador for another king. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. This is going to occur. We are present day ambassadors seated into enemy territory under which God himself already reigns. He reigns. We are speaking on his behalf to rebels who have taken up a place in his kingdom. We don't, we do find ourselves on a battleground for sure. Rebellion rages all around us, but our God reigns. The one that you speak for he reigns. He's the only one that matters. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says. It doesn't matter what Governor Pritzker says. It doesn't matter what your 
significant other says, your spouse says it. It doesn't matter. The ultimate matter is what God has established. And our God reigns. He reigns in your family. Uh, it should say he reigns over your family. Your family might be in rebellion against him, but he reigns. He reigns. The, the loved ones, your friends, your enemies. We, we're to pray for our enemies. Those people that have made themselves enemies of yours, you should still have that same desire to see them reconciled to God and reconciled to you as well. See them reconciled to God because there will be a day when their knee will bow. Today, today the one that came to your mind during the course of, uh, of this message, that person, one day their knee will bow. You think, well, no. You don't know the one I'm thinking of. That that person is, is so so established and sends such a rebel that they're mean as mean can be and and no there's no way that they would ever bow the knee you wouldn't believe the, the way that they blaspheme the lord you wouldn't believe the way that that they're hostile towards him they would never bow the knee no they will they will that they will not have a choice in the matter now they have a choice. And because they have a choice, their bowing would be relevant to the Lord. But there will be a day that that choice will be taken away. And nonetheless, they will bow. Every knee shall bow. Every one of them. And if you look into the Greek, every means every. There's no exceptions. That means when they get there, the Mussolinis and Hitlers and Mao Zedongs and all of those you know, notorious, heinous criminals, megalomaniacs of, of the last century, all of them will find themselves, Alexander the Great will find himself on his knee before the Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee shall bow. So when we go out and we go as ambassadors, we are doing the greatest favor for those who stand so desperately in need, reaching out to them, offering them through the gate of repentance and entrance into the kingdom of God, that if they will surrender to him and trust that his sacrifice will cover their rebellion they will be welcomed and they can bow now and they can be a part of that kingdom rather than being judged as rebels at the end and being forced to bow the knee to the king that they should have owned in this life when it would have made a difference the message of the messenger Probably won't have to spend a whole lot of time here because I've hit it several times already. But um, verses 18 and 19 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ recon reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and committing to us the word of reconciliation. And like I said, I, I've mostly covered all of this, but this is where it spells out very precisely our relationship to the gospel. That, that we have been reconciled to God and through that reconciliation, we are under his lordship and under his lordship, he commands us to go. He has given to us this ministry of reconciliation. Your first and, and primary um, activity within the ministry of reconciliation is to maintain your reconciliation to God himself. The ministry of reconciliation is first an internal one. You need to minister 
this reconciliation on the inside of your own heart. That you know how you do that? You look for rebellion. You look for disobedience. You look at your own life and say, you know, I've been given a ministry of reconciliation and I'm not fully on board with that. There's some rebellion against that. I've been excusing myself from that. I've been saying that goes to other people and not to me. I'm, I'm doing I'm not doing what I should in that area of my life. You can call it a lot of things, but if you are not engaged in some meaningful way in the ministry of reconciliation, as a believer, you're expressing some level of rebellion. Hunt that down. Do the ministry of reconciliation first on the inside and realize it's not okay. It's not okay that I don't do the things the Lord tells me to do. He that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. We can't just uh, dismiss these things as, as weakness or, or make excuses. None of those excuses will hold water. Each one of those will show as unfaithfulness to the call that God has put upon our lives as believers. All things are of God. In other words, he, he possesses everything. There's nothing that isn't his. That person that you think out of all the people you know, there is the one who is least likely to show up in the kingdom of God. That individual that he's his, she's his. By right of creation, it's all his. And everybody, everybody that is in it, the greatest rebel is his. That, that's why it's absolutely in his hands to do with what he will and what he has done in the earth is he has called out a people unto himself. He has reconciled a people unto himself and then he sends us out as ambassadors with the ministry of reconciliation to see the rest of the world around us come into a place of reconciliation, a place where peace has been made. You've heard of people who will, who will use these terms. It's kind of fallen out of use in this modern age. But you, know, you, you would hear somebody back when I was a kid, somebody would die in the community. And one of the questions that would always be asked if they weren't a, a, a visible portion of some church somewhere, they would say, well, did, did they make their peace with God? Did they make their peace with God? That, that, that's the ministry that we have been assigned to is making peace, taking the conditions of peace. As an ambassador, we take those conditions of peace and it's a pretty simple, that there's not a lot of negotiation necessary. We go out with the conditions of peace and we say, you, as a rebel against the God of all creation, you can live forever in blessedness in him if you'll surrender to him. Well, what about this, 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 and this? And I question these seven things. No, he says, if you surrender, that's the terms of peace. You must surrender. You must be reconciled to him. You must have him as your king or you're on the outside looking in. Will you do that? Well, I, I want to keep this for myself. I want this territory has to remain in my control. I'll surrender everything else. No, no. The, the conditions are unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender. There's no other way to come out of this unscathed. You, you will get, you will not have your rebellion imputed or credited to your account. You will go scot-free if you come in unconditional surrender to the king. That's the message that we have. That's the, that's the reason why more people don't carry it because 
It's rigid in a day when everything is supposed to be great. Everything is supposed to be the, this mushy middle. Well, you know, you, know you, you can take a good thing too far. Not if God has taken it that far. It's not too far to say absolute, unconditional surrender is God's demand upon humanity. And that's the gospel. The gospel is that you can, and through your message, others can surrender to the king and be accepted by him. I, I don't shy away from, from this reality, but when we look at how God dealt, now there are, I'm sure, many reasons that are beyond my understanding, but when Satan and the angels that followed him into rebellion, they were offered no quarter. They were offered no path back under our God. They, they were condemned to everlasting darkness in flames of torment. That, that, was their, that was their just reward for their rebellion. Yet every single human being has rebelled in a similar fashion as they did, yet God has some better thing for us. You know, it's like going into a prison with a handful of pardons. I mean, we, we can extend pardon to every single human being that we come in contact with, but the condition is they must surrender. They, they cannot maintain. They must lay down the weapons of their rebellion and take up wholeheartedly the allegiance to the king. They must be his. You must be his. I must be his. And it's not a wasted exercise to look at our own lives that periodically, I mean, I'm not advocating for constant navel gazing, but I do think that it's important to look at our own track record and see, are we fixed firmly in the kingdom? If we are, it's because of his grace. But we need to know where we stand. We don't need to deceive ourselves Jesus talked about it in these terms in the Sermon on the Mount. He spoke of the narrow gate and the narrow way or the broad gate, the broad way that leads to destruction. There's two gates, two gates. Everybody that's gone through a gate onto a way, believes that way, believes that gate led to a way that would lead them to heaven. They believe it. That they are, they are sure that they're going to heaven. Only those who have surrendered to the king are on, have come through the narrow gate onto the narrow way that leads to life. That means that all the unrepentant Christians that Christians that name the name of Christ, but there's been no transformation of life. They do not follow him. The, the bar for genuine Christianity is as many as are led by the spirit of God. They are the children of God. There is a reckoning day coming. Now, there is that ultimate one, but I believe we're being led inextricably towards a reckoning day in the here and now, in this time, whenever a shift in our repentance would really make a difference. I believe that more and more people are coming to the realization because of this understanding that's being laid out before us this morning, if you embrace this, you'll call to repentance all the unrepentant. Now, I can remember this has been 25 years ago, working with a fellow on the shop floor, and I would witness to him, or I felt like I was. And then one day he mentioned that, you know, something about church. And I thought, wow, that, that shocks me. So then I really 
witnessed in earnest to him and and basically called him to repentance and oh my goodness was he offended you know being an elder in his church blew my mind uh, I didn't wholly, hardly know what to do with that but his pride was such he couldn't believe that someone would have the audacity to call him to repentance with him being a leader in a church somewhere. I don't care if you're the Pope. It doesn't matter to me what your position is anywhere at any time. If you are unrepentant, you are unsaved, and you need desperately to hear the message of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. Someone needs to reach out to you and all of those Christian people who have no sign of following the Spirit of God, every last single one of those, and I'll put it in the air quotes again, those Christian people who are out there living an unrepentant life. I'm not saying the weak or, or the, the faltering or the failing. I'm talking about people who are unrepentant, still living as if God was not on the throne. Those folks desperately need someone to call them to repentance, to let them know that if, if you're not just really weak, I'm not going to judge you, but no unrepentant get there. Not one single one, anytime, anywhere. This is something that desperately needs to be on the front burner of the church in this hour because I guarantee you as this culture continues to descend, if you think there's no appetite for this message now, wait another year. Think back five years and how much of a decline there's been. But I'm telling you today, there is no salvation apart from the ministry of reconciliation. The, the calling of rebels to repentance and the restoration of relationship to the king. The last couple. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading with us. We implore, or pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the missing. The, the mission of the messenger is to be taking the gospel wherever we go and calling people to repentance. I mean, it's, it's as rare, to use the old country saying, it's as rare as hint tea to find people who are willing to call people to repentance. It's rare. It's as rare as the word of the Lord was in the day of Samuel. It's rare. It's rare, but I will guarantee you the eye of the Lord looks to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. If you have the loyalty of heart to put yourself out there, if, if you take the message of reconciliation to those who God puts in front of you and leads you to, if, if you're faithful to do that, that loyalty, God will show up and do amazing things. Amazing things. Things that only He can do. Because we have been called to an impossible task. I cannot reconcile anyone to the Lord. That's the Lord's work. That's, he, he does that work. He, he accomplished it on the cross. It's by his spirit that people are empowered to repent. It is by his spirit that people are empowered to share the message of repentance. It is all of God. Yet God has designed 
the, the order of mankind in such a way that he insists upon using us. He does it, but he uses you and he uses me if we'll be used. I think the message this morning qualifies for in there, verse 20, where it says, and we implore you. Uh, I feel, I feel every much as target of this message as every one of, uh, of you are. I really do. Um, you, you may look at me and, and think, well, you, you share a lot more than, than I do. Yeah, but there's still that reluctance. There's still that, um, th those moments of, of weakness, those moments of, uh, of distraction. There, there's those things. Every single one of us fight that. And every single one of us can have victory over it through Christ who gives us the victory, who, in whom we can do all things. Lord, I ask you this morning for this great grace to be extended to each one of us, Lord. I just pray that, that you will keep this before us, that you will not allow us to, to walk past this and, and go to a place where, where we can distract ourselves from it and, and carry on as we have in the past. Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, for the level of faithfulness each one of us have. Lord, I, I don't want to... I don't want to stand before you and, and act like nobody's doing anything because I know we are. But Lord, I just pray, God, that you would that you would lead us into a broader expression, Lord, of the, the ministry of reconciliation, Lord. It's been freely given to us. And, and Lord, you give us everything we need to accomplish your will and purpose. Lord, I just... I just raise it up before you, Lord, and ask you to, to use us mightily, Lord. And if there are those among us, Lord, that are, are questioning whether they indeed are reconciled to God, I just ask you to, to do your work there, Lord, to lead them to the place of surrender, Lord, that whatever they're holding back, that they would release it to you and that you would that you would be graciously waiting for them there. And we ask you for that in Jesus' name.